Hi, this is John Donny, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. Hello, me one. Hello, me two. So, me one, why are we speaking to each other like this at the start of our show? Just to make an exceptionally long podcast that little bit longer. I don't know, me two. Do tell. I will, me one. You know we've got Paul Morris coming on this time. Oh, the Doctor Who Missing Episodes guy, me too. No, that's Philip Morris, me one. But he does do a podcast about missing episodes. Philip Morris does a podcast about Doctor Who Missing Episodes, me too? No, me one. Paul Morris does the Doctor Who Missing Episodes podcast. Philip just finds them. Philip Morris finds podcasts about missing Doctor Who episodes, me too? No. Paul Morris does the podcast, me one. Philip Morris has nothing to do with a Missing Episodes podcast. So, Paul Morris is missing from the Missing Episodes podcast because he's on our podcast, Me Too. Exactly, Me One. But it's not the only podcast Paul appears on. Oh, I know where I've heard him before, Me Too. He's on the podcast that does those funny little skits at the start of each episode, written by the not only but also terrifyingly comedic and highly enigmatic banjo and kazoo playing Mr. Smith. You've heard it, me one. I have, me too. Something or other who? Just something who, me one. Who's on other who, me too? There's no podcast called other who, me one. Oh, me too. I could have sworn. Don't swear, me one. This is a family-friendly podcast. If you let me finish, me too, I was going to say that I could have, but didn't. Very good, me one. Now, Paul Morris is also a writer for Big Finish, don't you know? He is, me too. He is, me one. Well, before we talk about a big finish, perhaps we should make a big start, me too. I agree, me one. Let's get this f***ing podcast started, me too. <gasps> Language, me one. This is not the end! This is only the beginning! G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the Doctor Who podcast devoted to Doctor Who and the audio medium. Uh, my name is Dwayne, I'm your host, and joining me is Philip. G'day Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day everyone, good to see you all, hope you're all well. And our special guest this time is uh, Big Finish author and the extremely opinionated Paul Morris. G'day Paul. <laughs> yes, good Good day, good evening from uh, good night, yeah. From over here. Now this is this is not your first foray into the world of podcasting. You, you've done quite a few over the years, and you're and you're featuring regularly on a couple. Tell us a bit about those. I mean, you jest about me being opinionated, but I, I had to be forced into doing this. I had no interest in telling the world, forcing my opinions upon the world. <laughs> I still I still I'm not always entirely sure whether I should be admitting to what my opinions are. But yeah, Tim Burrows is my co-host on the Doctor Who Missing Episodes podcast. And uh, he, he dragged me into it. He's very He's been very keen on podcasting for as long as I've known him because he is very opinionated and very voluble. He's a very good speaker. I just, I, uh, I couldn't understand what the attraction was. And then I, he finally dragged me onto one. I had a few beers beforehand and thoroughly enjoyed the experience. And even, even when I listened back to it sober, I thought that went quite well. So... Uh, almost immediately afterwards, I got invited by my other friend Richard Smith onto. It would have been 13 cast at the time, which was just simply a mechanism for reviewing each of the uh, first series of Jodie Whittaker's Who uh, week by week, and then it evolved. We wanted to carry on when we got to the end of that series, and it evolved into something Who, which um, I don't know. I, I think it's an original format. It might not be, but we just take. We wanted some sort of very loose 
format to give it some st some structure rather than just turning up each week and and plucking a topic out of thin air. So we each week we pick one classic series story from Doctor Who and one new series story which have a tangential theme. Some of the themes were a bit prosaic when we started off. It was <laughs> things like um, these two stories have both got Cybermen in, and but we've I think we've elevated it now to a, a high art with some extremely tenuous links. What I kind of enjoy about it is almost that some of these links are so tenuous that it's, they might as well be random. That they are two stories that really have nothing in common. Yeah, I mean, the link is irrelevant to, to what makes each of these stories what they are. I enjoy being forced to compare two stories from, you know, across the decades. And, and it reminds me of that wonderful Doctor Who-ness that is there at the heart of every story. From what, whatever era, good or bad, there's something, I'm going to say quintessentially Who about it. Because that's what uh, that's a word that fans used to use back in the good old days. That quintessential Doctor Who ness they used to talk about, but they were quite, they were kind of right. Was a recent episode that you did that, that live episode where you had random stories thrown at you to try and find a yes. link? Yes, I, I was listening to that oh. one and I I found myself saying, "This is the link, guys. This is it." But you, <laughs> oh, you wouldn't come up with it. <laughs> you know, I should be offended, but um, you're absolutely right. We uh, we were terrible. I was particularly bad on that. I knew I would be. I <laughs> I need a little bit of time. If you're taking it seriously and you're actually trying to find a link, I need a little bit of time to think about it. I panic like a <laughs> rabbit in the headlights. But, um, yeah, I didn't really enjoy that very much. But, you know, a handful of the people who stuck with it seemed to enjoy it. So who knows? I'm sure we'll do it again. <laughs> there may be some tweaks to the format. <laughs> now, often at the start of Sirens of Audio, I, I take Philip what he refers to as a little trip down a rabbit hole. He doesn't often know what I'm going to discuss. But for this occasion, I've had a little chat with you two about what I want to talk about. And it's just to get some thoughts from us three fellas on cancel culture. Because you have, a, have quite a link to a classic Doctor Who story called uh, Talons of Wang Chiang which recently mm. is, has had quite a lot of stick given to it. And sometimes I feel when I listen to some podcasters and read some reviews that I, that I shouldn't be watching the show and enjoying it. Do you have any particular views on that episode in particular? I know you're hesitant to talk about it, but I'm going to try and draw it out of you. Mind you, you don't have to. <laughs> we did cover Talons on Something Who. Um, it was we, we paired it with... Uh, the unicorn and the wasp, but pretending it was our uh, giant animals link when it was actually just the Christopher Benjamin link. Uh, and um, yeah, I got cornered into discussing the contentious, controversial side of the story. And um, I, I, had it, I had all my thoughts prepared and I just couldn't bring myself to say anything on air. So after Richard and Giles in turn had, had said their piece, I rather cravenly just said no comment, and, and it moved on. Got a lot of abuse for that, probably deservedly. <laughs> but um, the reason I bring that up is it is relevant to what to the wider topic that you're, you've brought up tonight, cancel culture. It's not really relevant what my opinions are, whether they're conservative or progressive, or if I think they're going to offend people, or if I try to phrase them as benignly as possible, but they accidentally offend people. There is now a section of fandom and of the world at large which believes in this cancel culture. I've seen people arguing that there's no... I've seen other people press to discuss it and say, well, I don't believe it exists. But I think there's enough evidence that A, a lot of people want it to exist and B, that it does occasionally actually have a, an effect. Sometimes calls for cancellation are heard by the people in, ch in the powers that be in a particular sphere, and they're acted upon. Now, <laughs> whether, whether that's because these powers that be agree with the, um, the reasoning behind this particular call, that person X no longer deserves that patronage, or because they don't want the publicity and just want the problem to go away, so they cave in. Now, I'm not keen on that side of it. I'm keen on free speech. I'm keen that everyone in the cultural sphere feel free to voice their opinions about aspects of the cultural world that then political world that they're not happy with explain why and if there are specific instances 
specific comments by specific people, actions by specific people that they think need addressing, then address them. If they think they need redressing, well, that's where it starts to get into a grey area for me. And it does boil down to something very, rather more black and white, no, not enough shades of grey. When, when you're saying to, I don't like what this person said, I demand you stop employing them. I want them cancelled. I want them removed. I want their works removed as if they never existed. I don't want them to be employed anymore. That's where it crosses the line for me. It goes beyond the right to protest, the right to demonstrate, and into it's into something <laughs> a bit more sinister for me. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. Perfect sense. And mm. to give you an example, a little while back we we had a guest on this very podcast. Subsequently, we received messages from people who suggested that this person had made some really racist comments and had some racist views, so therefore we shouldn't be talking about his contribution to the world of Doctor Who. That confuses me a little bit because, firstly, I didn't really have all the evidence in front of me to back that up because I'm not just going to believe what someone might say on social media. But secondly, I'm not interested in any personal views anyway. I'm, I am I was just interest, interested in the person's contribution to Doctor Who. That's all. So to virtually say that that person doesn't exist anymore, I don't really understand it. If, if, those, if those views are true and correct, that's, that's not very nice. And I don't necessarily, well, not necessarily, I don't agree with them at all, but it even affected us here on this, on this little podcast where we're talking about Doctor Who, a, a fictional television show. So I like the way you sidestepped completely the content of the Talons of Wang Chiang. <laughs> because it's it's not just that particular story that uh, that gets a lot of stick. It's gone even further than that now. It's not just the fact that John Bennett had prosthetics on, or or they call it wearing yellow fla- face, or or whatever they call it. It's it's gone beyond that now. It's 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 almost the whole Robert Holmes era that gets criticised for some of Robert Holmes's views, which we don't know what his views were at the time. He's not here to tell us. We can only ascertain what his views may have been from some of his writing, which are, and I don't think that's completely fair to tar a person simply by their output, which at the time when I was a kid, I think, I think we all grew up in that era, 70s and 80s. When we were watching Talons of Wang Chiang, these views were not on our mind, and I don't think they shaped our racial views in any way, shape or form. That's just my view on that i mean the faulty towers episode the germans was was taken off netflix then put back on with a warning because of the use of the n-word and it's interesting that um that kind of cancel culture almost gives those on the side of full cancel culture permission to say the most horrific and horrendous things to people they feel justified in in saying it to so it seems a little bit hypocritical to me i suppose they see it as righteous anger don't they yeah it's, which is kind of contrary to and that, the message um, for, they're purporting to uh, yeah, go against it's not considered an equal fight because they don't see it as an equal a level playing field um mm. politeness is considered a luxury the idea that you should sit down and have a polite debate on these topics and it, indeed if we're talking about actual <sighs> 100% inarguable racism, for example, then yes, that's, that's one of those false equivalences. That's one of those false equivalences that D- Donald Trump um, tries to sell to the world. There are good and bad people, both socialists and Nazis are equal and opposite. Both demonstrators and fascists who try to close down a demonstration are equal and opposite. Well, no, that's not true. So uh, I'm not arguing that you should never face your opponent with the anger that you feel. But um, when it is not inarguable that you're 100% right and that your righteous anger is shared by the majority, I'm thinking perhaps you, it's time you took a step back, got off your high horse, got off your, your grandstand and just thought maybe, maybe there is still more to be said. Maybe I should try and engage with this other point of view rather than closing it down or walking away. Especially when it comes to things like a, a fictional television show. Well, yes. And again, the only reason people get so upset about it is because it does sit in context. It, I, <laughs> I used to study, do media studies. I understand it's naive nowadays to just look at a, a text and, and discuss it in the abstract. 
I, I still think you should be able to. But, which is why we should be able to discuss Towns of Wang Chiang as a piece of Doctor Who. But it also sits in context. So if you want to do that and not discuss its socio-political context at all, I have no objection to that. Why not? It is a piece of television. It's lots of things. If we're going to be, what's, what's the word, intersection about these things, one podcast should have, have the right to discuss an episode of Doctor Who as a piece of television solely, and another podcast should have the right to discuss it solely on socio-political grounds. Tons of Wang Chiang. I, I, I shouldn't sidestep it, should I? I've <laughs> written a lot of episodes of J. Young Lightfoot said in the Tons of Wang Chiang world. It's not that difficult to sidestep the controversy there because you're just using two of the characters and you can move them away from the controversial era just into a more gen- general, generic, foggy Victorian London. It's when I wrote the prequel, um, Talons of Greel, that I had to be more careful because I went into that assuming that some of, some of these hard decisions would be out of my hands. I, I went into it assuming that we wouldn't be using the characters where the actors were no longer available. I thought there would be no Chang, that that would remove the whole area of possible racist intent. Because even if Chang is not played by a white British actor, there's still the representation of the Chinese community at large, which is problematic in the original. But um, then I was told that, that Chang would be in it. So I made my own decisions coming up with the storyline. One thing you could have done, for example, why, why is it considered racist? Well, it's the depiction of the Chinese characters. They're all villainous and, and um, stereotypical. They're based on Fu Manchu stereotypes. They're based on other stereotypes of the Chinese community in, in the East End of London at the time. It flitted through my mind to introduce a heroic, virtuous Chinese character to balance that out. But that just seemed so trite. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If representation just becomes a matter of you can have one baddie if you have one goodie, it's does that and does that balance it on the on the scales of represent, representational justice? It just seems so trite that I thought I instantly dismissed that, and I thought it was better to take Chang and try and make him a bit more three dimensional. And all the clues were there for me in terms of Wang Chang because he is getting on for a three dimensional character in the original and. It, which is why John Bennett gives such a lovely performance. You only have to compare him to Magnus Greel to see that Robert Holmes is much more interested in Chang. I just thought if we could build on that, build on him as a person, and all the things about him that aren't for which his heritage isn't relevant, and remove the other tricky areas of his having gangs of non-speaking Chinese henchmen behind him. I thought that was a a step in the right direction. Did you? <laughs> did you? Uh, have you heard it? That story. Yes, yes. I think yeah. Philip, you've heard it more recently than than I have, haven't you, Philip? Yes, I listened this week. Oh, hello. Sorry to startle you. I've been assigned to Totters Lane temporarily. WPC Pond. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. The Diary of River Song, Series Six. Call me River. Really? An unusual name. Almost Romany. Now, well, that's what we call aerobics. <laughs> Ooh, that was fun, Miss Song. What sort of gun is that? A very good one. But sadly, it won't hold them back forever. So what do we do? We haven't got time for this. Silence! She's trying to save you. She's spaced animal welfare. I said silence! Ooh. Sir! Sir, they're ready this way! Get back! Open fire! Ah! Seize Did somebody call for the cavalry? Professor Song. Seize her! She must not escape! Henry? Miss Song, are you following me? Mr. Jiggle and... River Song. Charm. You get here earlier and earlier, Chang. Well... You know what I always say? If in doubt, shoot it! Big finish. We love stories. The audience is crying out. Please hear their stark entreaty. I'm listening. It's flattering. But nothing doing, sweetie. I cannot wait. I have to go. Goodbye and au revoir. 
So for me, it was just a balance between not, you know, choosing, not doing a self-cancellation, not choosing to ignore the troublesome aspects of the original, but approaching with a modern eye. And when I say modern, I mean, what, 40 years newer than the original. But things move fast nowadays, don't they? I just hope that people, that listeners, whether they liked it or not, appreciated that we all tried. And it wasn't just me, because the David, the producer, and Matt, the script editor, we all were looking at that very carefully because we wanted it to be right. We didn't want to offend anybody. We wanted them to be able to enjoy it. It's hard enough setting out to write a prequel to Sounds of Wang Chiang without having people not giving it a chance because of you've offended them before they've even tried it as a piece of drama. You know what I mean? So nobody wants to offend anyone. Let me throw in my 20 cents worth or 20 pence worth, depending on where in the world you are. Um, in, in terms of if you made talents today, I think it would be a dreadful thing to make. In terms of its depiction of female roles, there's just none there. In terms of the views of the Chinese, casting a white actor in an Asian role, we, we just wouldn't make it today like they did back then. But we need to accept the fact that it's part of history and show making 40 years ago is different to today. Um, I, I'm not sure you heard, I, I talked about the fact that the you know, big finish is about we love stories, not we love being politically correct. And yeah. there's, a, there's a point where, as, as, as a species, we are storytellers. We love stories. We love the power of stories. We love how our stories change thinking. Uh, and part of the issue with our world is people are setting their thinking and you can't change minds. So for the listeners out there, we're recording this four days after the presidential election. We still don't know who the president is. Um, <laughs> and so it's a, it's a weird phase that we're being in. But we've seen in America that you know, America is split 50-50, almost, um, in terms of their views on Donald Trump. And so... People have strong opinions about lots of things, and social media makes us have strong opinions in 150 characters. And so we have to be extra forceful with saying what we want to say because we don't have dialogue. We don't have discussion. Um, for those who, who are following anything about the presidential election, watching the debates, they couldn't, you couldn't, they couldn't even debate each other. You had to have, make a statement, they had to make a statement, they had to respond. But there was enough maturity between these two men to actually debate each other or debate the arguments. And so that, that's the world we've moved into. We've moved into a world where we can't do those things. I do think it's ironic that lots of people in favor of cancel culture, if you actually talked about the last bout of cancel culture, which was in, was in Nazi Germany, where they're burning books and telling people what to think, what to believe, the people today would be horrified to be compared with those sort of people because it's the people who would view themselves as, as very liberal, very generous. But the last time we tried to cancel culture was in fascist Germany. But, I, but it's, not, it's not that their hearts are in the wrong place. It's not that they're not supporting important things. We should be, well, I believe we should be anti-racist. We do need to treat people equally. We, we need to, but it's across all areas. But the question is, is a view that you expressed 10 years ago, five years ago, um, or a television show you made 40 years ago, should we judge it by today? And I think as the world continues to move, as our thinking continues to change, we always should be hopefully reassessing our views, how we view people, giving people worth and respect, because as human beings, so that's what we want more than anything else. We want, we, we want respect, we want significance. And anything that takes that away from people, yeah, that's bad. But we also need to recognise that as a society, we keep changing. And history changes, what we value changes. And I think, yeah, I think it's a complex issue, very serious, Dwayne, where to get started. When I want to talk about Paul and all these funny stuff he writes, because I think he's, he's a funny man. I would, um, I would hate to patronise <laughs> an entire generation of people, but what I do think is when I hear people coming from a perspective, it makes them makes it sound like they think that they, their generation has perfected life that history has ended with with this generation they've got it right from their lofty perspective they can look back cast a critical eye over all previous generations and they can do it with a complete lack of self-awareness because nobody's ever going to do it to them they've got it right and they can't <laughs> that's what i think i think general. every generation has always done that i think every hmm. generation believes we're the best. We've reached the peak of society. The past was always wrong. I think every generation does it. It's just that today we have the power to do damage with it. 
And so with social media, with Twitter accounts, with Facebook, we can get a message out to the world and offend the maximum number of people very quickly. Where 30 years ago, you know, you used to think we were the best generation, people used to think they were the best generation, but there was no way to communicate that to everyone, except just telling their kids it was better in our day. Um, yep. But today we have more power to actually get a message out and therefore, um, depending on how many followers you have, the power you have. Um, we, we had um, Rob Valentine on the show previously with the Lovecraft um, Invasion, was his episode's called. And of course, yeah, that, that, that experienced issues where he tried to write something very sensitive, very careful with the society, but even because of what was happening at that time, they held it back by an extra month and actually inserted extra dialogue just to make sure it wouldn't offend people. Um, which, you know, that's, that's a choice that Big Finish made and he made, and that's, you know, that's, that's the choice that, that people have to do. But yeah, I mean, my view is we all need to be a lot less sensitive, but that being said, I care about the things these people are caring about. It's just a question of how far you want to take it in terms of do you not employ people, do you start up a hate campaign? And as I said, you know, people... People who tweet around, have tweeted something bad five, ten years ago have a major hate campaign laid on them. They get ascribed views they may or may not have because no one's actually talked to them about it. And then has a, has a huge impact on what happens to the rest of their lives. And that, that's where I see the danger of where it can be. Yeah. Thanks, Philip. Our <laughs> listenership's just dropped by 50%. Maybe we should cut all that out, Dwayne. <laughs> Me one, hello. Me too. How are you enjoying Paul Morris so far this episode? Me one. He seems like a lovely fellow, but I cannot agree with him about the talents of Wang Chiang. Me too. Oh, you don't think we should watch it at all? Me one. No, I do not. Me too. Is it because of the racial stereotyping of the Chinese as a race of people? Me one. No, me too. Is it because of John Bennett's yellow face, despite Bernard Kay having appeared in blackface in the Crusades, yet no one ever considers boycotting that story? Me one. No, me too. Is it because the BBC should have cast a Chinese actor in the role of Chang rather than Englishman, even though an abled actor played a disabled character in the Daleks Invasion of Earth, yet nobody ever considers boycotting that story, Me One? No, Me Too. Is it due to the lack of roles for and generally sexist portrayal of women throughout that story, Me One? No, Me Too. I give up then. Why shouldn't we watch The Talons of Wang Chiang then, Me One? Because of Jago, Me Too. Jago, Me One? That's right, Jago, Me Too. What did Jago do to upset you, Me One? You remember when Jago and the Doctor in the cellar? And they found a money spider, me too? I do, but what's so offensive about that, me one? Jago insisted they don't kill the spider, me too. And that caused you offence, me one? Of course it did, me too. Why is that, me one? If I found a spider the size of a cow pat near me, I wouldn't be able to function until I knew it was dead. I could never, ever trust someone who refuses to kill a spider, me too. Is it really that serious, me one? Yes, it is, me too. I speak for all arachnophobes around the world when I say... Kill the money spider, Jago! Praise to the great one! Let's drag ourselves out of this rabbit hole. But I think it's important to touch on because of uh, your in- your involvement, Paul, with lots of aspects of that particular story. I think it's uh, an important one that we need to touch on. But let's talk more about you uh, as a writer. How did oh. you become a writer? Were you, were you writing before Big Finish? And I think Scarifiers was uh, the first ah, you do know about the um, thing that right. I can... <laughs> yeah, t- tell us about, uh, were you writing before that? Uh, not with any success, no. That sort of changed my life. I can feel myself about to to credit all my success <laughs> on my friend Simon Barnard, which I've vowed never to do again because I've given him far too much credit over the years. But <laughs> it's it's true. I've been trying to write since I was, since I knew what a book was. I wanted to see my name on the front of one. It still hasn't happened, but that's my next um, next goal in life. And uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't work it out. Up to a certain age, I, I guess all children have a lot of confidence, don't they? And a lot of imagination, and nobody censors them. And up to a certain point, I was just making up stories, boring the other children with them in the playground. And and then, and think, yeah, this is great, I'm going to be a writer, I've got so many ideas. And then, at some point, I um, I became self-conscious and I was looking at it, my work critically and thinking, oh, this isn't professional. Well, I mean, I was probably about 14, so of course it wasn't professional. But I, I was always lagging, be- from that point on, I was always lagging behind where I thought I needed to be to be a professional. And that lasted about 20 years, which was rather upsetting. It was rather a waste of time when I look back on it. But luckily I had 
you know, some friends who encouraged me to keep going. And Simon Barnard, I don't know, he said he saw something. We'd written for a fanzine together and I wrote half an article that made him laugh. And he just, yeah, we, we then spent ten years trying to write something together and failing. And eventually this, it came through with the Scarifiers. And then everything seemed to take off. What is this apparatus I'm attached to? It says on the label, it's a Polynesian witch chair. All I need to do is remove this peg and... Ah, you're off. You seem to have set me on a slow descent to the floor. Am I supposed to be scared? Shabney. Shabney Gura. What's that then, Welsh? No, worse than that. You've maddened it! Oh, oh, Mrs. Willow, your, your, your night dress seems to have come undone. Oh, good Lord. Christ alive! What are you doing in my toilet? Professor, how are you? I'm cold. If I'd known I was going to be offered as a human sacrifice, I'd have brought a coat. Christ, no! Dear God! No! The scary fires. The devil of Denge Marsh. Coming soon. It may be from another dimension, but it doesn't like the taste of hot steel. So what's the story behind the Scarifiers? How did that start? I think Simon was fed up with the fact that we kept starting writing projects and it wasn't going anywhere. He was a producer at the BBC, BBC Radio at the time. And what that meant was that he had the ability to get something made. Now, if you're thinking that sounds like vanity publishing, it is. But that's an interesting philosophical point. He made... We wrote the Scarifiers, he made it, he booked a studio, hired the actors, we made it, he, print, he pressed the CDs, put them on sale. So far, so vanity publishing. But then, how many does it have to sell before it stops being vain? When you get a second one or a third one, does it stop being vanity publishing? I mean, it's been going for a long time now. Uh, maybe it was the point at which he managed to get them on the BBC, actually. I'm, I'm talking to myself, here, answering my own questions. But what happened was, some of the people at Big Finish privately heard the Scarifiers. Um, I can't remember if they would have bought them on CD or if it was because, the, as I say, the BBC broadcast them on one of their digital radio channels. But um, some very nice people, such as Gary Russell and Scott Hancock, heard it. And they gave us our first introduction to Big Finish. People don't ever ask me, how do you get into Big Finish, Paul? What do you recommend? How do you recommend getting in there? And I'm glad they didn't ask me, because I wouldn't be able to give them a very helpful answer. Because essentially the answer is, start your own audio production company and hope that somebody at Big Finish... Um... But yeah, I mean, if you could make that answer more apl broadly applicable, it's that you must write. Don't try and only write for Big Finish. Don't just bombard them with unsolicited solicited scripts. Write for somewhere else, for somebody else. If you can't get published, publish it yourself. Matt Fitton, who's one of the most prolific and acclaimed Big Finish writers, I think I'm right in saying he got noticed, he cut his teeth just producing fan fiction and putting it on Gallifrey Base, I think. I hope I'm not slandering him there, but I think that's how he got going. If you can get your stuff out there and people notice it and can see that you're good, they will knock on your door because they want good writers. Sometimes who you know can help. It's not it sounds bad. It sounds like some sort of old boys network. But I think... And maybe that... It, to the extent that that was ever true, it was because certain people moved in the same circles. They weren't old boys circles. I mean, there was the, there was the Doctor Who fan pub in London. A lot of people met there. Not all boys, not all old. But they did know each other, so that helps. I think that is less important than ever in this modern virtual world and yes proving that you can write is the first step and the single most important step so i think i guess that's what we did the first week's finished script was a uh, benny with the road yeah. trip um bad yeah. habits so did you know did you know anything about benny beforehand um yes and no i'm just going to be really pedantic here and, and mention something else but I, I don't know why um just in case you know somebody might write a letter in we wrote, we wrote a short story for one of the um, the short trips books before that, but that didn't lead to anything else. But yes, the first audio we wrote was was a Benny, thanks to Scott and Gary, and um, I'd read most of the New Adventures back in the nineties, so I knew Benny from from there. I have to admit I 
hadn't heard any of her audio adventures, so I was about 10 or 15 years out of date by that point. But I went into it full of confidence. Um, I, had, I was full of confidence because I knew more about the character than Simon did. I just thought, I, unless she's changed drastically, she's going to be the same character I remember so vividly. I've always loved the character ever since Love and War. I actually had a re-listen to that yesterday. And, uh, yeah, you had me laughing out loud with the scene, the drunken scene with the <laughs> bishop. So that was uh, very, very funny. That popped into my head the other day. I want to give Simon the credit for that because it's his. He writes extraordinarily funny drunk scenes. There's one in the first Scarifies <laughs> as well. Uh, there must have been something he was going through in life at that point, but yeah, <laughs> mm. good isn't it? So, <laughs> so after that one, your your next foray was into Doctor Who proper with uh, Companion Chronicle, mm. uh, with with Sergeant Benton. What are your recollections of that one? That was a surprise. I was absolutely delighted. I think I got we got the email to say we were writing it on New Year's Eve. I don't know why I mentioned that. Simon found out and sent me a message saying, you'll never guess who it's for. And he was right, I didn't. I didn't guess. Because that's, that's the one and only Companion Chronicle. With... It was the, the one and only story that he did, that John Levine did for a very long time, wasn't it? And to, it, was, it was. It was his first but one. But he, he, um, he didn't reprise the role for quite some time until he showed up again in the unit, did he? But no, it was um, interesting. Took some time to think of latch onto storyline. So why did you decide to go with James Bond style? Again, that was Simon's genius idea. I think he thought that. <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. I think he thought John Levine looks like George Lazenby. Um, I, is that true? I'm not sure. Yeah, he does. A he bit, does actually. a little. Yes, he does. He does a little. Now you mention but, it. Um, <laughs> I don't imagine it was. That might have been justification. I don't. I don't think he's quite insane enough to have started from that premise and thought this will. This will fill an hour. But we we did want to take him out of the unit family. I mean, I think one of the things when you're writing a companion chronicle is you can either... You can try and some conjure up the atmosphere of an entire full cast Doctor Who story. You can do it if you're clever. But some it's also a very good opportunity to take an individual character and hone in on them, possibly by taking them out of context. I and mean, I wouldn't want to try and write a, an archetypal unit story when you can't hear the guns firing and the jeeps racing about and the brigadier barking his orders. It's, it's just losing too much. So we thought this was an ideal opportunity to look into who John Benton was. When his name was John, and that was about it, I think. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Companion Chronicles, The Council of War. It was one of those quiet evenings that it all started. As I walked past the doctor's lab, he called me in. Sergeant Benson, have you seen any ghosts lately? I didn't pretend to understand science the way the doctor did, but I knew for a fact that he did not believe in ghosts. This is Captain Crow of the Blatarian Mining Corporation. You have previously been informed that we would be visiting your planet to begin the final harvest of human slave units. Trial? What trial? The trial of Marjorie Phipps. I think in the circumstances there is only one verdict that can realistically be reached. Marjorie Phipps, I find you guilty on all counts. The sentence is death. Hands up. Nobody move. I swung round into the doorway, covering the room with my pistol. Half a dozen giant cockroaches stared back at me. The doctor straightened up and raised his arms to adopt the Queensbury stance. On guard! <laughs> Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. Can I ask, how do you write with a partner? How, how do you split up the work? How do you... Is it, is it similar with all the, all the stories you've done in, with a partner? Or do you do things differently um, each time? We, it tends to be that one or the other will have thought of the idea. And we'd, all, we'd both brainstorm ideas and one or the other of us would come up with the best one and we'd pick that. That person tends to then expand it to a storyline. And then after that, we would write separate scenes. Um, we outline everything down to the scene level and would just apportion them. It tends to be based on who likes particular characters. I mean, with the Scarifiers, we very quickly split into writing. I would write Professor Dunning and Simon would do all the everything else. It tended to be that he would do the stuff with the plot and the action and I'd just be writing funny stuff in between. So when did you... Um decide to write something on your own and how did you feel about that because i kept volunteering to write <laughs> funny stuff like in the, in the scarifiers and i can't remember if that 
applied to Big Finish as well, but I, I didn't get as much practice at, at storylining as Simon. And he's such a, an idea machine. I hope he's not going to listen to this. I mean, I'm only saying nice things, but I'm still nervous that it might sound like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> he was so good at ideas that he was... He'd always come up with you know, five ideas for every one of mine. And uh, I wasn't getting enough practice on my own. I wanted to... I, I just told him one day, I just need to see if I can do this. I'm, I, I love working with you, but, you know, a lot of the time I'm writing half of your story. And I want to know if I can do it. So we agreed that when you know if there are any opportunities and he was he was getting busy with other work so he we didn't always have the time it was he was occasionally saying oh have we really got time to do this script for big finish and i would say yes yes we have i'm not going to turn anything down he would say i'm not as interested in that idea are you sure but for me i get just as so much of a thrill and a challenge from being presented with a character or a set or a range that i hadn't ever thought i'd, I'd end up writing for so yeah, it wasn't so much, I won't turn it down because I'm desperate for the work. It's, I won't turn it down because I like writing. And you can get into a groove. I loved every single one of those Jake and Lightfoot's we wrote. But um, it's not like it ever became monotonous or we or we ever thought, oh God, not another Jake and Lightfoot. But um, being presented with something like, I don't know, Tales of New Earth, not only was that completely left, uh, left field as an idea for a Doctor Who range, but um, when they split up the set my story was the only one without any old characters in it didn't have any cat nuns or any face of bow or it was a completely blank slate apart from <laughs> the 10th doctor not actually in person so that that was the sort of challenge i was looking for right as now long story all original characters it must feel like russell t davis go oh, oh bloody hell coming soon from big finish productions doctor who Tales from New Earth. Once there was a world called New Earth, and some of the people who lived there were humans, some were aliens, and others were cats. And in that world stood New New York. Don't you ever want something different? How do you mean? An escape from New New York. All I want is here. There's so much more to see, Thorn. It's all out there, waiting. I'm telling you, Devon, things are gonna happen. When I was elected to the Senate, I had to take extraordinary measures to make the city habitable and safe again for its new wave of occupants. And that included striking a deal with Lux Incorporated. It's happening again. Cover your eyes. What? Just do it. Do it now. Why are you here? I came to see Thorne's brothers and sisters. Suddenly, a thin man in a stripy suit with a shock of dark hair poked his head out from the house and said, Put the gun away! He didn't do this. His teeth are nowhere near big enough. So, I don't shoot him. I've witnessed trees praying to new gods. The worshippers dancing full of energy. The scorch clearing on the other side of the valley. The light was bright. All hail the Lux. The Lux is coming. Oh, gods, what have they done? Big finish. We love stories. <laughs> it's a bit Big different. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, it's a bit different from our usual Victoriana. We somehow stretched Victoriana into the 1930s. But, I mean, uh, if you look at the entire spread of what Simon and I had written together, it, um, I think a lot of it is set in that very particular, slightly pre-war England. And it's not necessarily clear which war it is, but it's, it's pre-something or other. That's how I got started uh, writing on my own. I said on Facebook at the time when my first solo story was released, it was like riding a bike with the stabilisers off for the first time. <laughs> and Simon thought I was comparing him to a miniature set of wheels and said this is a bit of a backhanded compliment. And I said, yeah, you're right. So you mentioned Jago and Lightfoot. You, you're involved with every series from series box set seven on mm. to the end. Um, did you spend any time in the studio and, and get to chat with um, Christopher Benjamin and Trevor Baxter? I did. I was in the studio for almost all of them, which was a wonderful privilege. Yes, it was always a privilege to be in the studio, but particularly with those two. Christopher Benjamin is one of the nicest people I've ever met, and Trevor was one of the funniest. And um, between the two of them, there's lunch times. And it's wonderful lis sitting listening to them reading out my words. It doesn't get much better than that. I think them and, and also Tom Baker, hearing Tom Baker read my dialogue for the first time was um, the only thing that's 
is based on that. How did you get involved with Jago and Lightfoot in the first place? Yeah, uh, that was... Um, was it the next thing after after the Sergeant Benson one? David it Richardson was. must have seen something. I'm just assuming it was him. Must have seen something in our writing that he th- thought would work on Jago and Lightfoot. So he got us in, and he liked the first one. And we wrote... So he commissioned us again for the next set, and he liked that one. And it just seemed mad. A mad few years where... I kept thinking, well, you can't possibly put us in the next box set, because I'd listened to the first half a dozen, and I knew that the writers, there was quite a big turnover of writers. Even the best writers were rested occasionally. And, um, you know, just to keep it fresh. But no, no, kept asking us back, and one year we even got two stories in the same box set. The trick was to not get complacent about it and think, oh, not another Jake on Life and also, and not get... Um, big-headed about it and think blimey we must be good at this but we didn't think that of course i'm just saying hypothetically that would be the thing to avoid but i can't imagine what sort of writer would <laughs> think either of those things not any writer i've ever met well, it's part of being a writer's oh absolutely I, well, you were think- well, I was thinking um, the opposite this can't go on this they're <laughs> going to find us out anytime now coming soon from big finish productions jago and lightfoot series 13 behind you <laughs> Who are you exactly? We, sir, are Jago and Lightfoot, infernal investigators. We are but the first, my liege lord. We should make haste to bring the warriors through after us. I admire your appetite for battle. My name is Agent Kara. I need access to your records. I need to know where Greel can be found. What's she going on about? Magnus Greel? You know Greel too? Henry and I were once. Unfortunate enough to encounter him. What what happened to him? The giant rat, Henry. The giant rat of Wang Chiang. We didn't quite close the case. Jago? Well, that's him there. Oh, wonderful. Anyone else want to drop me in it? Don't stand in my way. I ain't. Mick, don't get in her way. Oh, Gordon Bennett, I always sit here. Anyone will tell you that. Do I have your attention? She killed Mick. No! No! Stay back! Stay back! Big finish. We love stories. Um, all the Jago Lightfoot's have quite distinct. Each box set has a very different feel and theme to it, from cruise ships to future mm. to um, vampires, whatever. Um, I, th- I think that probably helps make it a lot fresher. Do you think that's why Jago Lightfoot stayed so popular? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I used to have a very bad habit of reading all the forums, and um, if you read the reviews from fans, I'm not doing inverted commas, listeners, but I might as well be, that there was, you'd, after a certain point, you'd think that nobody ever liked any Jago and Lightfoot, but they were still buying it. So I think that there are quite a lot of very vocal people who claimed not to like the fact that we kept changing the setting. But I'm, I don't think it would have lasted if you're just carried on doing endless boxes that were set. And it, you can only do pastiche Town to Wing Chang so many times. And I'm not saying any of the early stories were that, but they were. The early seasons didn't move that far, geographically or tone-wise, from Talons. Even the first few tentative editions, like adding in Leader or the Sixth Doctor, didn't change the shape things that much, apart from adding another flavour into the mix. But I think once once you start seeing if they'll work in different places, different times, that's when things get interesting. You were asked to come back to do the the final Jago and Lightfoot yeah. um, after Trevor had passed away. What, what was it like? How, how did you work out how to wrap up and end something which had been so wonderful? I had to go on instinct with that. Yeah, it's a strange position to be in. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but um, it was slightly familiar. We in the, On the Scarifiers, we'd been in a similar position when Nicholas Courtney died and we ch- decided to carry on. And we had to just um, decide how we would treat the loss of his character. And um, there are some similarities with what I did with uh, Jake and Lightfoot. I thought it had to be both about the loss of 
the lack of Lightfoot, even though the character, the main difference here is that the character was, was still alive. Some of the scripts were written recently, including for the um, for season 14, which unfortunately wasn't produced, were getting more into more depth about their relationship, what they meant to each other, Jake and Lightfoot, both professionally and personally. And they're still in that sort of frame of mind, so it seemed like the obvious thing would be to make it about them, about the loss, the absence of Lightfoot, rather than trying to pretend he wasn't absent. And then, because David had suggested that we could have him in it, topping and tailing the story. Well, I think he just wanted. I think he originally suggested just at the end, using um, old, I'm going to say, footage of of Lightfoot to suggest the character was still there. So I knew we could have a big celebratory ending. The structure of the story just seemed obvious to me somehow. I think we agreed it would concentrate on the main guest stars. Inspector Quick, Ellie. <laughs> we even threw in Bessman, played by David Warner, because everyone, every recording studio is improved by the presence of some David Warner. I thought we could make it clearly about Jaguar Lightfoot, the series, and the characters by concentrating on the main cast, but without making it too self-referential or metatextual. That's what I was trying to pull off, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So that's why when um, Jager's getting deeper into into the snow globe, the, the strange, unexplained, deliberately unexplained snow globe, which is just sucking away his memories, is, is sucking him out of the real world and taking him away from everything he knows and loves. And the characters disappear from his memory in the order in which he would have met them. So the longer he'd known somebody, the longer they hung around. I just enjoyed taking him slowly away from that setting that we'd known through, what, 13 previous box sets, until there's almost nothing left, and then bringing him back from the brink and, su- and then switching gears completely, and then being knighted by Queen Victoria with every single guest character we ever had. We just kept um, one-upping ourselves, I think, David and I, with w- which other characters we could have at the end. He kept saying, such and such an actor's going to be in the studio. Could you write them a few lines? And I go, oh, yeah, sure, how about... <laughs> But they also played so and so, so we could put them <laughs> in as well. And it was a, it was a real labour of love for everybody involved. It was a lot of work finding those lines for Lightfoot and on paper. And then I think for the sound designer, <laughs> at the other end of the process, it was just as, just as tricky. So Humphrey, we wanted to ask you about George Lightfoot, my associate. He's disappeared. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Jago and Lightfoot forever. Well, Mrs. Hudson hasn't seen him since Monday afternoon. But it's four days ago. Quite. It is good to be back. Quite. Not a cruise I shall ever forget. May I just make one thing clear at the outset? We do not make people disappear. Well, that's good. Unless we have a very good reason. Espionage. Spies? No, no, shush, shush, shush. Well, how do you know him? Our paths crossed during the invasion. He definitely knew about your trip to save the Queen. He circled tomorrow's date in his diary. Look. Get out of there! Your boots sunbags away! What? No, don't untie that rope! No! no. Stop! Uh, and you stole my runny balloon! Borrowed! There's only one man who can save the day. Another drink, Inspector. Better add. Could be a long night. Big finish. We love stories. Then what are we waiting for? Come along, Henry. The game's afoot. I think it went. It seemed to go down well, and I think it's one of the things I'm most proud of. If people thought it did the characters and did Trevor justice, with, even though he wasn't there. You know, I, I know that technically you can occasionally tell certain lines are out of context, but I just think it's. I don't really see there's any point quibbling about that because what else were we going to do? It's the only way you could handle it. And I think you just have to try and listen to it with that part of your brain turned off and just enjoy it for what, what it's saying about the characters. You could really tell that at the end of the series that um, Lisa Bauman was, was, was really affected by Trevor's passing and um, that showed. But I recall really feeling for uh, Ian Atkins, I think on the book, box set for season 13 he was very excited that he was dropping the short trips or leaving short trips and coming across to produce Jago and Lightfoot and there was great plans for the future and 
Um, I, I still remember the excitement that Ian had. I, I know you wrote a story with him. I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was, but did you ever talk to Ian about uh, about that and how he felt about that? Um, obviously, it's a tragedy, of course, but he, he must have felt some disappointment. Yes, I... <laughs> Obviously, it was a big disappointment for Ian because he was producing it and it was one of his... It would have been a big step up for him as a producer. We worked on it together. We had, we met and got on. When he was setting out the writers for season 14, he asked Simon and I for ideas. He had, an, he had a plan for the overarching story and we, and we got involved and then I got involved even more. We were all thinking of it as a, a new, an exciting new beginning. And of course, it wasn't an exciting new beginning in every sense because it was carrying on, it was resolving the cliffhanger from season 13. But it would have been the first steps towards gently pushing Jake and Lightfoot into some, some exciting new areas. What will the 14th season look like? You can tell us that, can't you? Justin Richards had left us with this cliffhanger. Uh, Jake and Lightfoot had spent season 13 in an alternative dement- uh, parallel world. And at the end, they thought they were home. But then they look up and above the London skyline is a large uh, airship, spacey looking airship. And they think, oh my goodness, uh, are we back home or are we in another parallel world? Are we going to explore, we're going to answer that question at the greatest possible length over the, the entire four episodes. We just did a lot of brainstorming because Justin didn't know what it was. <laughs> and we didn't ask. So we, would, we just came up with our own <laughs> ideas for, for what was what's happening. And um, it was going to be... If anything, even tighter as a four-part arc than than some of the other box sets. Um, it had a lot of mystery and suspense in it. Uh, the first story in particular had a set up a who can you trust um, sort of conspiratorial vibe. We are riffing on a lot of our favourite invasion of the body snatchers. They they live sort of, sort of stuff kept popping up. And then um, we're even going to bring back a. I won't say obscure, but a relatively unexpected villain uh, that was original to Big Finish um, for that set, just because it's, it happened to fit. I don't think that any, anyone's ever mentioned what that would have been, but I'm not, so I'm not going to say now. It um, would have been interesting. would have been something that nobody would have expected to pop up in Jaguar and Life. Anyway, we wrote all four scripts. Well, and why, why, so why, why can't you tell us who? Why can't you tell us what? Because they might still do something with these scripts, because we wrote all four of them. And... <laughs> And, um, oh, okay. and, you know, they're very good. And also we've been paid for them. So whether on grounds of quality or on grounds of not wasting money, Big Finish may well, I mean, it's been a few years now, but they may well um, dust off the, the shelf on which they've been put and think, oh, yes, we could do something with these. They may well do that. That's okay. all I'm saying. I'm not tapping my nose in a Tom Baker-like style. <laughs> Well, I guess I mean I, I mean originally, you know, Chris, Chris Benjamin said he was interested in continuing without yeah. Trevor, um, and yet and yet suddenly he's been able to come back in a number of ways um, without Trevor, which has you know not been Jago and Lightfoot, but still very much Jago, and you know Big Finish originally weren't ever going to recast actors, and yet that's starting to happen. So I guess there is always the possibility that you know Jago and Lightfoot may come back Goodness. at some point. I mean, so, yeah, I can't I can't see it. But um, I think, obviously, the last few years have, have proved never say never. I can't personally see it. I think you, you balance up the unthinkableness of recasting some of these people against the importance of the character. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago that people would have thought you could never replace John Pertwee. But that's the third Doctor. That's a whole Doctor. We can't have a missing Doctor. Or you can't replace Sarah Jane. Or Elizabeth Slade. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, John Hurt. Yes, huge important areas of the program are closed off if you can't if you don't go that way. But that's Doctor Who, and I do wonder if. Um, you know, so I'm just thinking to myself here now. I'm thinking. I think the main reason you probably wouldn't do it is there's a lot of Jagan. It's not like Jagan life was cruelly cut short. There's a lot of it. It was incredibly fortunate. Uh, I think Jason Hay Gallery was a fan. I used to go to Big Finish Days back in the old days before I was even writing them and be delighted when he would get um, he's up on the stage and somebody in the audience would say, are, we, are you doing any more Jaguar Life? And he would just spontaneously commission another few series there and then. 
<laughs> yes, where was I? I don't think that's the main reason. I don't think there's a need to recast Jago and Lightfoot. Not for another fifty hundred years. But who knows? I mean, outside of Doctor Who they've recast Steed and Mrs. Peel in the Avengers. Uh so that's equally unthinkable. You could e- you could equally yes. say who needs any more Steed and Mrs. Peel Avengers? There's a lot of it on on my shelf in glorious Blu-ray. Why do we need any more? They're fantastic. Great stories, very funny. Well I yeah more tongue in cheek than the, the series was. I think it's great. We got to write a few of them as well, Simon and I, and uh, that was a that I was a lot know. of fun. That <laughs> Oh dear. It's a different kind of different kind of humour to try and um, get your head around. I thoroughly enjoyed those. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. My name is John Steed and this is Mrs. Emma Peel. Delighted. The Avengers. The Mrs. Peel comic adaptations. Volume 2. England. With all the funny gentlemen in their bowling hats. How does it feel to be the lady in the company of a brave, bold knight? Sir Lancelot Steed. I'm afraid this is a gentleman's club. That's right. I'm looking for a gentleman. Tarquin Stradley. Milliner to millionaires, hatter to high society. What's a chinchilla doing on top of a taxi? Pitching a lift. Steed, don't move. There's a rattlesnake sliding up the arm of the sofa. Don't look at me like that. It's not breaking and entering if it's open. Lair of a crackpot inventor, if ever I saw one. I'm so glad we're faced with something perilous and life-threatening rather than an entertaining weekend. Oh, of course, they've got a tank. <laughs> two gorillas in a hospital ward? Uh, two angry gorillas. My afternoon was rather explosive. I've never had a bowler do that before. And God save her highness. Because nobody else will. Steed and Peel must die. You must be terminated. You're doomed, John Steed. Doomed! I'm not in control. I can't steer it. Let's jump. We'll be killed. We'll be killed anyway. (laughs) 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 Mrs. Peel, we're needed. Big finish. We love stories. With the Avengers, did, are you a fan, are you an old fan of the Avengers in terms of that's why they asked you to write, or was it just something that they said this is coming up and you did some research? Um, I was a casual fan, and Simon was a big fan, but that had nothing to do with it. It's a very particular style, and I think they were they thought long and hard about who on earth could possibly pull that off, and they they approached quite a lot of people just to say, can we do this? Can we do the Avengers on audio? Give us a sample. So we pitched for it with a sample, and they said, oh, this sounds a bit like the Avengers. Wow, maybe they, maybe we can do this after all. And uh, that cheered us up. So that was also quite an interesting technical challenge, because they came from very short, sketchy comic strips. The best thing about them was they had big, mad plots. Sometimes they were too mad, and you had to rein them in a bit. But it was um, often... And this sort of genre, a big idea to start with, is the way, is the most useful thing you can have. Once you, without that, any amount of storylining and clever dialogue won't get you anywhere. You just need a, a big idea, and that was what <laughs> one thing you couldn't deny the Avengers comic strips had. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, Olivia Poulet is just amazing as um, Emma Peel, yep. and just the way she bounces. Mm. <laughs> Cass, in terms of um, you've uh, now become been writing for the new Heritage box set with the Paternoster Gang. Mm. Is writing that similar to Jago and Life sort of, it's a similar era? How, how do you find writing for a new set of new series characters? I think a lot of listeners and fans thought they were more similar than they are, that it would be a... If Big Finish ever got the rights to the Pat Noster Gang, it would sort of seamlessly follow on in exactly the same style as Jago and Lightfoot. And there are, there are differences. Um, I think one of the biggest is that all the new series stories are supposed to feel like modern television. They're supposed to be a lot faster with shorter scenes. It doesn't always come off that. That's that's a guideline. They don't have to. I mean, you, you don't have to write Jake and Lightfoot like it's 1970s studio band television. And you don't have to write every episode of the Pat Noster Gang as, a, as if it's a zippy and as a Stephen Moffat episode. But, you know, that's the general guideline. So it's not filling an identical space. But, yes, for a hack like me, who does no research into what Victorian London is actually like, and just bases it on other <laughs> previous fictional representations of Victorian London, then I suppose in 
that side of it is similar. The first one I wrote, uh, The Ghosts of Greenwich. Every so often, I think, with Jago and Lightfoot, we would, after having gone a long way away, if we'd ever gone too far away from fundamentals, we'd bring it back into a foggy, gaslit street episode. And that's what I tried to do with my first Pat Notster gang story. But of course, you don't have to. You can take them anywhere because it's about those three, three characters. And some other even bigger differences. One thing that's quite can be tricky with Jacob Knife is that there's no doctor, which means that if you have any advanced technology, advanced science, there's nobody around to explain it. Either villain's got to explain it, or at a push, Lightfoot often ends up with some sort of supernatural ability to understand advanced technology. He can extrapolate from 1890s science and somehow imagine what this this device could be. You don't need to worry, and um, which is why I think most Jake and Lightfoot stories stick to the supernatural. They look I don't know, backwards or sideways, I suppose, rather than to the future. But you don't need to worry about that with Pat Noster Gang, so you can have science fiction galore and Vastra will understand it. Jenny will understand it to a point because she's been trained by Vastra and Strax will understand it but probably won't be able to... <laughs> probably not in any useful what sense. What about it up? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I've just listened to number four and um, yeah, particularly uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Jago. And Strax is hilarious. Like, the lines you've given him, I was laughing out loud. Um, I know a lot of people, fans, you know, doing that to the Sontarans is wicked. But mm-hmm. in terms of Strax, it just works so well. And he's just such a, a he, yeah, huge, over-the-top character. And, um, yeah, it was a very funny yarn. Thank you. I do, I do like writing Strax. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> there seems to be a debate among some listeners think that he shouldn't be too stupid. That that's, I, I think it's, you don't write him as if he's brainless. You write, he has his own frame of reference, his own, he'll underst- understand things, but it won't matter that he's understood them because his, he's just a character with a unique take on the universe. I think that sometimes they're always single focused. I mean, you look at Lynx. He had no concern about the future. He had no concern about giving power weapons to people who had no idea how to use them, no idea about the politics. None of that concerned him at all. He just powered on, this is my mission, this is what I'm doing. Um, strike, you know, was it Strike? Strike? It was in some kind of experiments. Oh, uh... He was exactly the same. He was the same character. He was just, you know, I'm going to experiment with these human beings. Even after he had all the data, he didn't care. So sometimes I've always been driven, single-minded, and unconcerned about any repercussions and i think strax comes across the same way he just you know, powers on with his thinking um and no matter how many times he's corrected with you know boys blowing things up whatever it just becomes humorous so i think yeah i, I love i love the character yeah i mean he's never used any great length in a tv program i don't think i, I mean correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think in any of Stephen moffat's episodes you <laughs> I think there's some pathos in uh never the doctor yeah. So the one with the, yeah. the one with River Song. But by and large yes, no, by and large he is I almost feel like I, saying something is a is comic relief is a dirty word, like I feel ashamed to say it. But he is the comic relief. Of course he is. That's how he's used. He's, he's used sparingly. He pops up, he's extremely funny, extremely violent, and then fades into the background again. I've always considered he's quite Shakespearean, because Shakespeare always had a character who didn't have a huge purpose in the storyline but he was there to either relieve tension when it needed to be relieved or to allow you to have a false sense of this is funny and then something serious happens so i've always viewed him as a very shakespearean character that's very good i like it he's uh yes puncturing tension is is a very good point i think one of my favorite comic devices which i probably overuse horrifically is having somebody puncturing the seriousness for a situation normally after a suitable pause, which I make sure I measure out in seconds in the script. It will be very funny if it's exactly this long before Strax comes in and says something ludicrous. I can't remember now whether it was just good luck that I'd come up with a storyline about which re- involved the house's Paternoster Rose defences and then realised that this was a great opportunity to, to mention lots more ludicrous weapons that Strax has in his armoury because I went back and rewatched all his appearances in the show as research, which doesn't take very long, but that is—they are the things that stick out at you. Great love of acid, 
which I made sure. Yes. <laughs> Almost, <laughs> there's, he's never met a situation that you can't you can't fix with liberal quantities of acid. I was must have been, I was thinking at the end of the episode though what the house must have been like at the end, having had acid running all through it. <laughs> she must have a lot of money to be able to clean up this mess again. I can see it. I'd love to. I mean, yeah. Sometimes you write. Sometimes you don't have a very strong visual sense of a story, and other times you you do, and other times you don't. But you'd love to somebody with a more visual imagination than you to to bring it to life. But yes, I would love to see what this house looks like. I, I've got a cross section of it. I had to draw it actually because <laughs> it was such a tightly written story. So I always try and fit too much into 60 minutes and um, I had to know exactly how many levels down everybody was going so that I could keep them apart but also have them meet up again at the end I think I, my first draft had one too many floors in these in the basement section of the house so it was taking too long so I took one of them out and suddenly it worked and I think I also got them I was stuck at a particular point in the plot was stuck and I couldn't work out what to do next and then the acid came to my rescue I thought I just thought flood the room with acid brilliant <laughs> and have and have Jay go through the day with a magic wand. You see, this is why I like writing for Doctor Who. You can't, you don't get the opportunity to do things as ridiculous as that anywhere else. And then bringing the triples as well, you're all set. Oh, yes, and yes, and steal, <laughs> steal from the greats. If you can steal from two or three great things and combine them into one, even better. Christmas, one and all. Strikes this alarm. I beg your pardon. I said these alarms. What about them? Turn them off. Of course. Now, which button was it? <laughs> ah, perhaps not that one. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, The Paternoster Gang, Heritage, Volume 4. Strax? Well, bless me. Mr. Jago. Good to see you, sir. Apologies for my rudeness. I assumed you were merely random human scout. Oh, you brought the gang. Young Jenny Flint. And you, Madam Vast, I'd know you anywhere, veiled or not. That creature was a scourge of the Silurian era. A gribbleite. It can't be alive after all that time, surely. Uh, that box of yours, eh? is it just me or is it wriggling? If the Gribbleite reaches too high a temperature, our problems will multiply. Uh, Mum, we've got a problem. Oh, no! Good, what the difference? It looked different in the shop. Word has spread about you, Madame Vastra, and I believe I have found the truth within those rumours. Back in the day, I knew your kind as apes. Primitive, impulsive, and suspicious. Little has changed. My people know this legend too. It is the tale of Anura who stole power from the old ones. I know you are waiting. All life, all carbon forms will be immolated and reprocessed. Tomorrow sees the final dawn, and Earth's cycle begins again. Big finish. We love stories. Your Christmas present. Oh, how kind. I'm afraid I didn't get you anything. Quite all right, Mr. Jago. I have everything I could ever want. Except a fishing lance. Oh, for some reason, I just keep thinking about that bishop in Bad Habits playing with his organ. <laughs> uh. Yeah, the the really rude jokes are always Simon's. I've got to, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not prudish, but I sort of shy away from them. Somebody's going to find an example now of something extremely filthy that I've written. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we never asked. How did you? How, oh, sorry, I just wanted to know how did you get into Doctor Who in the first place? Well, you know, when did if, you first? Do you, do, you, do you ask all your writers that? You couldn't miss it growing up in Britain, though, in the seventies. Um, it was just always on, wasn't it? Maybe it wasn't always on. I, I sometimes people seem to remember when you're asked what your first memory of Doctor Who is. Some. Sometimes people seem to remember things from when they were four or three or two or whatever. I, can't, I haven't got any memories from before I was five, but I, it was the Hinchcliffe era, and I think it was on slightly later then, wasn't it? Was there a few years when it was on six or half six? You wouldn't know, would you? You'd have to be real, it was on every a, night real obsessive to know British <laughs> viewing. We were in Australia. We had on every single night at six o'clock for years, just got re- re- repeating over and over again. 
Yeah, I, yes, I used to, yes. <laughs> I was very envious <laughs> in the 80s when Doctor Who magazine would tell us what Australia and America were getting and we got one repeat. Every other year would have one repeat from the previous series and that, that was your lot. Apart from the five faces of Doctor Who, which uh, ah, which was just seemed like a glorious dream in, in 1981, which soon faded. Anyway, I, I think it was at the height of, yeah, I think possibly my parents didn't let me watch it quite as early as they should have done, because it was the height of the Hinchcliffe era, and possibly a bit too, a bit too scary. But I was there in in front of the telly on a Saturday evening in time for Talons. So I did see that the first time round. So one of my earliest memories. So it's, it seems fitting that it came back to haunt me later on. My juvenile memories are of Tom Baker when I was young enough to. I knew said to think it was all real. I never thought it was real, but you know to to be actually be scared by it. And then as I moved into being old enough to become a fan of it as a television program and start thinking self consciously of myself as a fan, it was Peter Davison. So I think that's why. You didn't ask me what my top three thrills of, of working at Big Finish have been, but I think I've mentioned Tom Baker and, and Trevor and Chris at Jago and Lightfoot, but um, writing for The Fifth Doctor and Tegan and Nyssa was up there as well. I did have to go up and tell them that it had made my, made my day, made my year writing for these three. And Janet, Janet looked suitably moved. No, she didn't look moved, but she was very nice about it. She was very nice. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Whilst cleaning silverware, one must not be overzealous. Each time a knife, fork or spoon is polished, a little of the surface is removed. Doctor Who, Aquitaine. Doctor? Doctor, are you there? Doctor! It's nothing to do with the TARDIS, it's a distress signal. Well, aren't you going to answer it? That's what I've been trying to do. Just need to lock on to the signal. No one sleeps on the HMS Aquitaine tonight. The lights of a thousand galaxies twinkle in the infinite darkness outside. It's worse this time, more violent. Tegan, hold on to something. I take back everything I ever said about your driving. There is no such life sign now. Your friend is gone. If there's no one else here, then what was that? Merely one of the voices, yes. Voices? You didn't say anything about voices. Are you saying this chip is haunted? It's happening again, sir. Who are you? What do you want? Please! It is a sad state of affairs to be a gentleman's personal gentleman when one's gentleman or lady is missing. Big Finish. We love stories. I must say I really did enjoy that episode, though. It was Aquitaine, wasn't it? Yes. Excellent Thank colour, you. too, on that. Really stands out in my mind. <laughs> oh. which, you, which you had nothing to do with, but thanks for the cover. We, um... Yeah, no, um, I, bring back Hargreaves. I'm trying to get that hashtag trending. We do enjoy writing distinctive and funny supporting characters, and we were pleased with Hargreaves. And then Matthew Cottle was terrific. And I've no idea why they weren't, why Jason Hagerley wasn't on the phone immediately saying, let's have a whole series with Hargreaves the robot. He, makes makes he no sense, does it? But it makes no sense. No, of all the things that have happened in my life, and no doubt yours. I think that's possibly the least explicable. I noticed one of your next releases is going to be re- come out in February 2022. So, like... Oh, right. Okay, like, I was wondering. Like all uh, <laughs> Big Finish writers that come on, I try and persuade you to break your uh, NDA and tell us what it's all about. But it's a Tom Baker story, isn't it? Yeah. You've got the title, have you? Uh, I don't... The title's in the public domain. I don't but think if you... so. Oh, you haven't done your research. S- S- oh, that's right. S- yeah. Shell shock. Yeah. It is. Shell shock. Um, I've done my research. What does that suggest to you? War. Something after a war. Oh, maybe there's a war in it. Okay, that's suitably vague. That doesn't tell you anything. Okay. No. Maybe. Or who's, or who's got the shell maybe, shock? Or... Maybe they revisit the giant clams in Genesis. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
that was the brief, and they thought you're the men to do it. <laughs> uh, very good. Anyone can. I mean, shell shock. Shell shock's more a first world war term than a later war term, right? If a person so okay, be fun. Looking forward to it. No, yeah. no NDAs will be breached today. When did we record that? It must have been. Was it 2018 or 17? Oh, it was a long time ago. Really. But, um, yeah, that you, well, I mean, you know, every, everyone says that, don't they? Didn't Dawny say that? How just how far ahead they are with Mr. Baker? Mr. Baker well, T. 2024 20, 20, at the moment. They've got the 2024 series all filmed and filmed, recorded. So, yeah, they're quite a few years ahead. I'd be surprised if they weren't further ahead than that, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. Well, that, I mean, if they were four what, years ahead, on, if they were four years ahead four years ago, if you see what I mean, yeah. I'd, yes. I'd assume they'd still be at least that far, unless... They've slackened. Maybe they have slackened. I would only get everything excited. I'd always thought with Jago and Lightfoot it would have been good to have um, had one episode in the can. You know, how um, Agatha Christie wrote her final Perot and final Miss Marple and they, they weren't to be published till after she died, but she kept writing after that. It's, um... It would have always been good. But I guess it'd be too expensive a big finish to just record an episode and put it in the can, you know, put it in the file for years. I think it is. I mean, I'd, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it would look on the, account, on the accounting, on the books, but... Um... It's, they produce so much. They I don't think they can afford to think like that. They have to be practical. Maybe I'm wrong again. Maybe they have got some things like that lined up. And but I'd be surprised. By and large, you don't need it, do you? It's um, and where you might think you might, it's the sort of area where you might not necessarily want to admit that. Mm. Now it's, it, gets, it gets a bit macabre if you start thinking like that. It was macabre for Agatha, for Christie. She um, she wasn't worried about anything other than her own survival, was she, when she wrote Curtain? Yes, true. Is this the more stuff that's been recorded that we don't know about? Are you writing at the moment? What can you tell us? Uh, well, how I'm... you do at the moment? <laughs> uh, no, I can't. I can't. Well, yes, there there are. There's at least a couple of things that are in the can. I think that um, you haven't mentioned, which I can't mention. Okay. Um, there's another script that hasn't been recorded yet, which I. I really hope. <laughs> oh dear, it seems it seems fated not to be, but um, maybe one day. There's another another companion chronicle that I wrote for Ian Atkins, and um, circumstances have conspired for it not to have made it onto the set that it was planned for. But I can't that, really go that's the one you wrote with Ian diesel. Atkins, isn't it? It was the Varden one, the Varden invasion of Merth. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. For Stephen, basically, I just thought, <laughs> I don't know, was it me? I don't know. I, I I thought rather naughtily. What, what does Stephen Taylor mean to me? I just thought he's the straightest companion ever. It's not <laughs> like he's got no sense of humour, but but he hasn't really, has he? I mean, I don't want to be cruel because uh, he does make a joke about some blackberries in the <laughs> Time Meddler. But other than that, I don't think he ever. And he's unintentionally funny in The Gunfighters because Peter Purvis is very funny. Um, yes, Ian did come to me with the idea of writing about old music hall comedy. And that was that was my spin on it, that it would work well with Stephen because seeing him, I'm just thinking what's the trickiest situation you could put him into. I mean, locking him up for three years on his own um, with marauding Daleks and mechanoids is one thing. But being forced to be the f- straight man to a comedian on British television... It seemed like the, yeah, terrifying. <laughs> yes, I think so. That was what that's what I was going for. Did it work? And then it turned out to be quite terif- terrifying to write because Ian was full of. Oh, we, yeah. As I say, we got to know each other quite well. <laughs> Meaning when we were planning many years of subsequent Jago and Lightfoot's. Um, I could say, was it, uh, how different experience was it writing with someone different? Because I, mean, I assume you got very set in your ways. Um, <laughs> uh, that was uh, slightly more specific. Um, I, we knew we needed some comedy in this, some actual comedy. And I knew quite early on that Ian was much better at that than me, because I'd seen proof of it. He can write pastiche comedy sketches in the old style. I, I realised that if I've got any knack for comedy at all, it's um, character comedy. So it's making realistic, semi-realistic characters funny unintentionally, you know? Like, Jay and Liver don't ever think they're being funny. And Strax doesn't think he's being funny. But it's a very different thing. It's a very different thing writing an actual joke. 
In some ways, the setup for a funny line is structured like a joke. There's a, pay up, a setup and a payoff. But it's not like a joke joke, like a comedian tells. And I, <laughs> I can't do that. And Ian can. So that's why we worked together on that. And that's kind of how um, it broke down. Although he also was very helpful um, simplifying the story, structuring it. And um, yeah, and it was his idea, mostly. Well, bits of it. I can't remember now. It was only, few, <laughs> it was only about three years ago. I can barely remember. But um, yes, it was different. I think you've, you've remembered so much. It's marvellous. Some people come on and say, just don't ask me anything because I can't remember anything. <laughs> you've done really so, well with, with your stuff. Other people have written hundreds of stories. It will start to slip. I remember when I, when I was early, early on in the Scarifier's days thinking, my God, I'm a professional writer now. Isn't that, I can't believe this. I never thought that would happen. I, and I thought I was... I thought, unlike every other professional writer, I would never forget any details about anything I'd written, both story details or behind-the-scenes details. It would all because, as a fan, I know everything about everything. My head is full of all the minutiae of how every Doctor Who story ever made came about. I can remember everything about all the different drafts of Dalek's master plan. And then, within a few years, I realised I'd forgotten most of what I'd done myself. And then, by the time I, I got into the embarrassing situation of somebody coming up to me at a convention and saying, oh, you're Paul Morris, how did you, such and such come about? I realised I'd fallen into that trap. Um, so that's, I think that's how you know <laughs> you're a professional, <laughs> is when you can't remember a bloody thing that you've done, because it's all about the next one. Thanks very much, Paul, for coming on to talk to us about your work with Big Finish. It's been fantastic to hear some of your stories. Really appreciate that. Uh, one <laughs> thing we like to do with our guests is ask for recommendations of something that you have been listening to doesn't have to be doctor who related uh in any way shape or form but is there anything that you've been listening to that you can recommend our listeners if you don't know who guided by voices are go and listen to some you'll thank me for it guided by voices but then you'll have that's music guided by voices you'll have to throw out the rest of your record collection to fit because you'll get hooked and uh, then you'll find that you'll have to buy a bigger house guided by voices okay american okay post-punk rock band Definitely, I'll, I'll check it out. Philip, what about you? What have you got to recommend for us? Uh, I might do a, what I've just finished listening to with Big Finish, which is the new Master, War Master oh, I haven't box heard set that yet. with um, Dirk Jacobi. It's just spectacular. And yeah, there's a huge shock at the end of the second episode, which I should have seen coming because it was there, all the clues were there. It was a bit of like a twisty thing. It was a bit hidden. And then, so an amazing second episode, yeah, climax of the second episode. But the whole series is not what you expect, but really fantastically done. So, I mean, Derek Jacobi, I yeah, adore anything. And, you know, uh, Paul McGann, his, his usual form in a couple of episodes. So really worth listening to. It's a great release. Did you just mention Agatha Christie? I did. Oh, sorry. I had to, <laughs> no, go, no, no, no. Had to go, go and close the <laughs> no. kitchen door. What you, <laughs> I can't ask you to repeat no, yourself, can you? I'll just listen to it when you broadcast this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as exciting as you think it is. I was just describing how the um, the first two episodes of the new War Masters been set up like a bit of, well, a bit like an Agatha Christie. So the first episode in particular is a heist story, yeah. but the two episodes are giving you clues about something which is a big twist at the end of the second episode. Which, if you yeah, it was like Agatha Christie. If you paid attention throughout the first two episodes, it it's there. But like she always does, it's just this twist of hand. You actually, well, all the clues were there but I missed all of them. And then you go, oh, but how clever is that? And so the first two episodes of the new box set are all these clues being given. Terrific. Um, which made me feel, I, I knew something was happening, but I couldn't work it out. And then you just go, ah, oh, and it was a huge moment. <laughs> and who wrote that? The, end of the second episode. That is Lisa McMullen. McMullen? Ah, is that right? Both of them. I think so. Uh, she, she did two episodes and... David Llewellyn, I think. Amazing. Episodes one, three. Excellent. So the two of them worked together, but yeah. Lisa. You're into it. Lisa is good news, right? Well, that's great. Oh, she's she was she was brilliant. Um, good. Well, I love Agatha Christie, so I um, I'm I'm currently trying to write a, a mystery novel of my own, as I imagine everybody is. <laughs> so I just thought I'd say that on so it's on record so that people can come back to me in the future and say where's your mystery novel you, you said it was coming okay, well you, so, once it's getting released people... let us know and we'll plug it for you <laughs> right okay <laughs> alright and if, if you're interested in my recommendation um, I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion I don't know why it's shameless why is it shameless that you promote yourself 
but it's it's kind of not really. Before I came onto this illustrious podcast, I was on radio for about ten years. I did a classic rock show, broadcast out of the uh, the massive t- locale of Hobart, Tasmania, and um, to cut a long story short, I noticed on Twitter one day that Nick Pegg and Barnaby Edwards were going to be in Tasmania. Well, they were touring around Tasmania, so I just contacted them and said, uh, while you're in Hobart, in Hobart, we don't get many Doctor Who celebrities in Tasmania, would you mind uh, meeting up for a drink? And they said yes. So I met up with uh, Nick, and, Nick and Barnaby, and in the process I found, because I didn't know at the time, but I found what, how much a um, guru on uh, David Bowie, Nick Pegg, was, and he'd had the book, and we got talking about that, and I said, well, would you mind coming on and guest programming one of my shows for me. So he agreed to come on and do the show. So um, I'm going to put up a link to the two-hour show. of My show was called Kaleidoscope Ears, and I focused a lot on 60s and 70s. Um, but Nick Pegg came on and did a David Bowie special for me as a guest programmer, doing lots of rarities, lots of stuff that you wouldn't have heard before, and I'll put the link for that in the show notes. There you go. Can't wait to hear that. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, thanks once again, Paul. Really appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Hi, this is Nicholas Pegg, and I play the Daleks in Doctor Who. So listen to Kaleidoscope Ears, or you may find yourself exterminated. So that brings us to the conclusion of another instalment of The Sirens of Audio. We hope you have enjoyed that one. Don't forget you can send us your feedback at Audio Sirens on Twitter, sirensofaudio at gmail.com via email. We're also on Facebook, so drop us a message. And please, if you like what you hear, drop us a rating on iTunes. It will help other people get the message that we are here and we'll get more people listening. Do us a favour. Do us a favour, would ya? Make sure you stick around for the next episode, which is dropping on the first Thursday of December. We have a very special guest in Janet Fielding. You're going to enjoy that one. So until then, keep listening to lots of lovely audio because you know why? Audio drama... (gasps) Rocks. Rocks.